Hey guys, this is my first post here, and English is not my native language, so please be patient with me. This isn't the creepiest story of all time, it just stuck with me because I'll never know what happened afterwards. I'm a small, skinny female student in my late 20s who works part-time as a waitress. It's usual for me to walk home late at night, and my town is not known for much crime. Nothing really ever happened to me here, but sometimes I had strange encounters with customers at the bar I was working at. Those stories are for a more suitable subreddit, though. It was about four in the morning a few weeks ago on a Monday, walking home from my late night shift on Sunday. I read a lot of stories here, and so I'm always aware of my surroundings. I don't like that some random customer would know my address or where I live, so I like to take different routes to my apartment. I was on one of the main streets of the city, but it was very late, and the city is quite small. It happens often that I don't even see a single person on the way home. Suddenly I heard yelling all over the street. Since I was alone, small, and not very strong, I walked slower and hid behind a wall. I tried to figure out where the noise was coming from, and there I saw them. A seemingly young couple, arguing heavily over something, in the middle of the road. I decided to keep hidden since I didn't know exactly what was going on. I dialed up the emergency number of my country, just in case I might need it in a few moments. I kept watching on, because I had to pass this way no matter what. That's when he grabbed her hair and pulled it heavily. He was just beating her for a few seconds, right in the middle of the street. The scene was over quickly and they vanished from my side behind a big car, still yelling at each other. I thought about calling the police, but thought that there couldn't be a thing done, especially because they had stopped, and if you get involved in something like this, the woman will sadly often deny what happened. I was still hiding behind the wall, and I was quite torn. On one hand, there was nothing to report anymore. On the other hand, though, I felt responsible for the girl's safety. I tried to sneak a little closer, and the yelling stopped. I wasn't able to see them anymore. After waiting for about 30 seconds that felt like hours, I decided to continue on walking home, because they were nowhere to be seen. Instant regret is hitting me really hard, but I didn't know what this guy was capable of, or if he was carrying a weapon. Weapons aren't that common in my region, though. I told you, it's a safe town. I had to do something, so I turned back to where I last saw them. There was the girl, already walking fast towards me, hoodie down on her face. She clearly had a defensive body language, so I wasn't afraid of her. I could see her realizing that there was another person on the street who might be able to help. The man was still behind her apologizing to her. That was when he also saw me, and he stood still immediately. The girl was crying a little as she reached me. I could see she was way younger than me, and I tried to look as angry as possible at her attacker. The man got my look, and totally stopped following her. I asked her if this was her boyfriend, and she said yes, but they'd only been on a couple of dates. She told me that she was only 16, and she had to go home because it was already late. Yeah, a 16-year-old on a Monday at 4 a.m. She definitely was. Right then, a police car drove by, also the only car on the road. The man scared away. Their yelling was so loud, of course one of the residents heard them. They were smarter than me and called up the cops. The girl told me her name and that she didn't want to get involved with police because of her strict parents and her being way too late already. No one in the police car saw us, and I told her to walk home because I wanted her to get there safe. She was glad and we walked away from the police car. Dumb thing to do, and I regret it. I should have insisted that she told them her story. I know that now. In that moment, I thought it was the right thing to do. 
I walked her near to our apartment complex. It wasn't the direction I had to go. The man vanished after he had seen the police car, and I made sure he didn't follow us. He ran away in the opposite direction. I gave her my phone number and told her to write me a quick message when she got home safe, because I felt a bit responsible for her now. The next dumb thing to do? I didn't walk her to her door. She was a naive, maybe shy girl, and I told her to break up with this piece of shit immediately. By that time, he'd sent her five messages and called her quite a few times. She never texted me back. I hope she got home safe and did break up with him, but now I'll never know. I didn't want her to feel forced to give me her phone number. Now I regret this too. It likely was just a fight between two dumb and young kids, but I hate this uncertainty left inside me. He seemed angry, but not serial killer crazy. Maybe she was just too cool or afraid to text me, or she found it not important enough. So, to the girlfriend beating wanker, let's not meet again. And to the girl, well, I hope you got home safe. This happened to my husband and I about three years ago, late in November. It still gives us chills to this day. While living in Seattle, my husband and I would frequently go surfing. Usually we drive out to Nia Bay or Westport, but on this particular weekend, the surf report looked pretty messy for spots located directly on the coast. We decided instead to try hitting some spots along the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The land along the Strait is beautiful, but remote. You can only access it by driving all along Highway 112, which runs from Port Angeles to Nia Bay. There's no cell service along almost all of Highway 12, and only a small smattering of small towns. We decided to try surfing along the strait in this one spot, Twin. We'd surfed there before and had a good lay of the land. The report showed that the waves would be best in the early AM, so we opted to drive out the evening before and sleep in our car overnight. Since it was late November, we decided to forego paying for a camping spot at a nearby campground and would just park somewhere along the beach at Twin. We figured there would be no one there, and we were right. We arrived at around 3.30 p.m., and the only other people parked were a young couple and their Westphalia. Nothing terribly eventful occurred between our arrival and 7 p.m. We arrived, cooked some dinner, and I took a quick walk along the beach. The only other thing that occurred was just before sunset, we heard this loud whistling, and then saw some guy who had been walking along the highway come down the entrance road towards the beach. My husband and I both thought it was pretty fucking odd, given that there's absolutely nowhere you can easily walk to along that highway. All he had with him was a tiny backpack, so he definitely wasn't hiking. He said hello to the young couple as he walked along the beach. They invited him to hang out by their campfire for a while, the last time we saw any of them that night was when my husband and I decided to call it a night and go to sleep. This was at about 7 p.m. I woke up about an hour later and opened the car door a bit to try and get some fresh air. I noticed that the young couple's Westphalia was gone, and something about them being gone unnerved me. I couldn't put a logical finger on why, so I chalked my feelings up to just being tired and laid back down. When I woke up next, it was close to 11 p.m. This time I shot up so quickly that my husband woke up too. He asked me what was wrong. I said nothing, that I just woke up startled. He seemed completely relaxed and fell back asleep, but I stayed up for about 15 minutes trying to listen for anything. In hindsight, I think my intuition was screaming to me that something was off. Since I didn't hear anything though, I laid back down and really tried to focus on getting some sleep. About 20 minutes later, I woke up again. This time, my husband was already up. 
He was sitting there silently, listening. Him sitting so still freaked me out. I turned on the car's interior lights and asked him what was up. He whispered, someone was tapping on the windows. I remember feeling this deep sense of dread. When I woke up a few hours ago, I noticed that the couple in the West Folly are left, and there's no one else camping here. At that point, we both put our shoes on, grabbed flashlights, a knife, pepper spray, and opened the doors. Total silence. Pitch black darkness. My husband started up towards the trees behind us to look around, while I stood by our car and shined a light down onto the beach. I saw no one, and sat on the back bumper while he continued to look. I checked to see if I had cell phone service. Nope. Nothing. Maybe two minutes later he returned, walking very fast. We need to leave. There's a car parked up by the exit road. It's just sitting there with the lights off and the ignition on. I couldn't tell if there was anyone inside. No more than 60 seconds, we threw everything in the front seats into the back where we'd been sleeping, started up the car, and started driving back up towards the entrance road. We didn't want a chance taking the exit road and driving by that car. We peeled out of there so fucking fast, but in a moment of disorientation, my husband turned the wrong way and started driving down the highway towards Nia Bay. As we started going the wrong way, we drove past the exit road, and lo and behold, there was the car now with its lights on. A few seconds later, we both noticed that the car was speeding up behind us. I practically screamed, What the fuck are you doing? There's nowhere to turn around! The highway is narrow, with forest on one side and ocean on the other. Luckily, we saw a small turnout coming up. I remember my husband just saying, Fuck! over and over, and then cutting hard to the left. As soon as we cut left, the person following us just kept going in the same direction. We took off down the highway going about 90, back towards Port Angeles. No one followed us the rest of the way back. I still feel deeply creeped out when thinking about the intentions of whoever was in that car. To whoever stalked us in the night, let's never meet again. I lived in a very medium-sized town my whole life. It was overran with the drugs, and had one of the worst homelessness problems per capita in the country. Living there, I knew not to trust anyone, but I had enough friends there that I mostly felt safe. I transferred colleges to one of the biggest, richest cities in the country, and when this happened, I had been living there for about a year. I felt safe there even alone. My school and home were outside of the regular touristy places, and my neighborhood was mostly retired rich couples or students like myself. I felt safe walking to and from school by myself, so I wasn't expecting this to happen. I normally don't give any strangers the time of day, mostly because I just didn't want to interact with people, but this day I guess I was just feeling a bit talkative. I was in my neighborhood walking back from school, but still a few streets away from my house, when I heard a voice above my music. I pulled out a headphone and stopped, and I heard a man calling out for me. I placed it behind me, but didn't see anything, and figured it must be coming from the car behind me. I don't know what was going through my head this day, and why I didn't just continue heading home, but I walked towards the car. It was a tan SUV, not screaming danger, but I made a mental note of the first three of his license plate. When I got to the passenger side window, it was already rolled down, and there was a man sitting in the driver's seat. He was in my general age range, had on nice clothes, a button-up and tie, and was admittedly attractive. Not out of place, and not immediately untrustworthy. I thought he needed directions. He asked me if I went to my college, and I said yes. He told me he sees me by the science building every day, and thought I was very pretty. This is where my alarm bells started to ring. 
My major was nowhere close to science, and I was only ever on campus twice a week, if that. He asked my name. I gave him a fake one, but told him he must have mistaken me for someone else because I was never by science. He got extremely nervous, and I started to pull away. The alarms in my head were screaming at this point. He told me to wait, and asked if he could take me out for drinks right now, even though it was barely noon. I turned him down, citing the fact I had a boyfriend. He said, what, you can't have friends? In a condescending and forced casual way. Scared now, I apologized and said my boyfriend was waiting for me. A lie, but I felt like he needed to know someone would miss me. I've never had such strong fight-or-flight instincts hit me. I pulled away and walked away as fast as I could. I guess in the heat of the moment, I failed to check if he was following me. The next day I had class, I was walking up my street and stopped dead when I recognized his car. I feigned realizing I forgot something and walked back into my house frantically texting my boyfriend. I stopped walking to class for a whole month. A few days after this, I was getting ready to leave for work. I was working the open shift, so I was leaving my house at 4am. Even before this, I was very careful about being aware of my surroundings, before and after getting into my car. As I was pulling out, I noticed his car about two houses down from mine, closer than the last time. I texted my boyfriend and let him know, and we agreed I wasn't going to be leaving the house alone until we figured out what was going on. I work in an industry that casually attracts cops, and the morning shift especially invited at least five of them at any time to be hanging out in our lobby. I had cultivated a strong and friendly relationship with quite a few of them. The morning that I left and noticed him, I sat down with all the cops that had gathered for the morning and explained my situation to them. They said that while something wasn't right, they couldn't really do anything for me because no threats had been made. Not long after my conversation with my cop friends, one of them was responding to a call about a suspicious vehicle. Completely by accident, he recognized the car as my description of the man's car and remembered my story. He told me he walked up to his car and asked what he was doing just sitting there, citing the call they had received. He noticed obvious evidence of surveillance. A camera, a few notebooks, food wrappers, and water bottles. They ran his info, and it turned out he had a warrant out for assault with a deadly weapon and harassment. I was called in shortly after to identify him and make a statement. After he was arrested, I was told it was obvious he had been stalking me for weeks. He had documented even when my boyfriend came and left, and admitted to wanting to kidnap me at some point, having all the equipment to do so in his car. He said he was just waiting for the right moment, but my boyfriend was always in the way. I thank those cops every day for saving me from what could have been the worst experience of my life, and my observant neighbors for calling his car in. Moral of the story, trust your gut, and always be aware of your surroundings. I was 18, living in college dorms several hours from home, and working as a waitress at an upscale bar and restaurant. I'm short, barely 5 feet tall. I'm used to people being creepy and trying to intimidate me now, but as an 18 year old whose father had tried to protect her from the world, and had been raised in a tiny, friendly town, it never occurred to me to be scared of the people who lurk in the dark. We had plenty of regulars, several of whom I became quite close with during my years working there, and a few of the frequent diners learned my name and general facts about me. I'm generally pretty open about who I am. One such man was tall, lanky, and several decades older, appearing to be in his mid-fifties. Joe. Joe was kind. A good man with a generous nature who owned a local shoe shop. The second time I was his waitress, 
He'd gifted me a pair of slightly worn work shoes and insisted that I accept them. Because of his kindness and the way he carried himself, people of all types flocked to him. One of them became the first man outside of my family that I feared. Joe came in with his younger brother, about the same height, slightly bulkier build and not unattractive, as I recalled. His eyes, though, unsettled me. In high school, I fancied myself a bit of a writer, but nothing in my vocabulary then or now could describe how unsettling his gaze was. It seemed almost dead, lifeless, but I assumed I was simply nervous. Joe was a good man. His brother was probably just less carefree, a bit more intense. The two dined together a few times in the coming weeks, but while Joe would normally request me as a server, he asked our host to assign one of the other servers to his table after the first time. Then one night, Joe's brother came in alone and requested me by name, and I was happy to oblige. For the first time, he seemed relaxed, energetic, and charismatic. He was interesting with a quick wit and a story for every topic I could throw at him. By the end of my shift, I assumed he just had a hard time relaxing with his brother. That may have been true, but through the laughter and charisma, his eyes never once seemed kind. They remained through it all, lifeless. Eventually, it was time for me to leave, but he was still there and still expecting service. My manager offered to take over the table. He'd make sure I got the tip, but it was common knowledge I had an early morning class and likely had to do my homework. I jumped at the chance, but went to finish some closing duties and asked the man, my last table, if he needed anything else. He seemed off. As soon as I said I was heading home, he seemed to harden up. His voice was clipped and reminded me of my controlling ex-stepdad, which immediately put me on edge. I'd heard the same tone often enough as a little girl, right before being hit. I left immediately. I called my best friend and offered to buy him dinner if he'd meet me at a diner between the dorms and my work. I don't know why I did. I just felt that I needed someone to meet me sooner rather than later. Joe's brother hadn't in any way seemed dangerous, outside of the terseness in his voice before I left, but I knew that for most of my walk, which would have been poorly lit, I would be safer with the companion. We met together at the diner. We ate and laughed and headed back to the dorms, a good 25-minute walk. Only 15 or so in, the hairs on the back of my neck seemed to burn. Something was terrifying me, and I didn't know why. I told my friend who brushed it off, until he looked behind me and yelled. I turned and saw him. Joe's brother, only a few yards behind us holding a metal bar. I don't know what they're called, but you see them at construction sites, usually for reinforcement when pouring concrete. He was gripping it hard enough that his knuckles were white. It terrified me to my core, and I screamed. My friend grabbed my arm and we ran, even though my heart was in my throat and I couldn't hear anything past the blood roaring in my ears. I swear I could hear his footsteps right behind us. We ran right to the dorms, and I told security, who had us wait in the office while he looked at the cameras in the lot and called the police. The cops showed up but did nothing since all he did was scare us. After they left, the security man asked a few more questions, and made a comment about a man standing at the entrance door for a bit before walking away. It was assumed he was homeless, but my blood ran cold. I called in for a few days, and when I went back to work, Joe was in. I told him what had happened, and he nodded. He didn't even seem to question the validity of what I had said. His brother, it turned out, had done some time for stalking and sometimes even attacking young women. He had even been sent to trial for assaulting one and hospitalizing her. Somehow, he had managed to avoid jail time for the assault, but Joe said it was only a matter of time before he killed someone. I didn't see Joe often after that, and I never saw his brother again. The owner of the restaurant was angry for a long time, 
accused me of running off a regular who spent a lot of money when he came in. It took a few more scary encounters to make me a little more cynical, but to Joe's brother, let's not meet.